supports are important structures, but how do they gain displacement and how do they grow? We're going to look at the displacement patterns on a single fault, look at how folding and faulting may work together. Then we'll move into three dimensions, look at faults growth and structures called relay ramps. We'll then try and develop understanding about how displacement is acquired on faults. Almost all this understanding comes from normal faults, chiefly through the exploitation of subsurface resources and the need to understand faults better. So let's add some fault geometries to seismic data that we've seen. Some faults seem to go through the data all the way, some stop, and there's some folding structures on the side of one of those faults as well. How do these all work? So let's start off with a single fault surface. Here we have a block diagram with some stratigraphy which contains a fault surface. Let's pull it away and have a look. So here's the fault itself, the pink disc. This area is slipped and outside the pink patch we're assuming that this had, the rocks have not slipped. So let's add a layer to see how this works. We can see we've got displacement of that layer across the pink area but not at the margins. So if we look at the fault slip trajectories, they're down like this, it's a normal fault, so the arrows are displaying the direction of slip. As we move up the fault plane, we can see that other horizons are also offset like this until we get to the top and we're beyond the fault and the horizon itself has not slipped. So here's our fault surface again, and those arrows are giving us the amount of slip across the fault. Let's just contour that up. So there's a displacement maximum in the middle, and this bullseye shape shows displacement decaying away to the edge of the fault's patch. The very edge of the fault is called a tip. It's a tip line. It's a line in three-dimensional space that lassoes the slip surface. Beyond the tip line, there's no slip. So we can see here, when we put our horizon back into the hanging wall, where the maximum slip is the middle, decaying away to no slip at the tip line on both sides of the diagram. So coming back to our seismic, we can identify on the profile in here a fault terminating upwards with no, no offset towards the top and at the bottom. So our tip line goes in and out of the screen, threading through those two yellow blobs. So here's another fault next door. And an interesting feature of this is the folding adjacent to it. These features are classically termed drag folds. And I'm putting a question mark on that, so let's think about how drag might develop. What that means is that we have a fault fully developed through the section in here, and then we move on the fault, and then the rocks fold because the fault is sticky and the wall rocks continue to move past, deflecting against the sticky patch on the fault plane. So in other words, the fault becomes stickier or stronger than the wall rocks. The wall rocks take up the movement rather than the fault plane itself. So that's what is implied by the term drag. An alternative evolution is this, that the folds are developed at the tips of a growing fault. So as the fault develops and propagates out, increasing in length, the previously developed fold at the earlier tip is then carried by fault displacement. So there's a tip line fold there and a faulted tip line fold that portrays the earlier history of fault growth. This is probably a better explanation than the classical drag one for most situations. So much for profiles, let's move into three dimensions. So here we have a fault tipping out into our block diagram with a throw seen in the profile edge of the block. So this is the lateral tip. Here comes another fault with its own lateral tip growing, the two faults trying to grow towards each other, just missing each other. Let's grow some more and you'll see that now we have the faults overlapping one another and the rocks between deflected into an inclined surface. This is called a relay ramp. Eventually, this may fail as the faults continue to grow, so-called breach relay ramp, and now we have one long continuous fault through the entire block diagram. It's a single hard-linked fault. And here's a really great example seen in the landscape uh, in afar. 
So let's draw the faults in. So the pink areas are the fault surface, and we can see a relay ramp coming through there facing the viewer as these two faults have tried to grow together. The relay ramp. Let's go to another example now. We're going to stay in the region but move further up to the Red Sea margin to here on the Gulf of Suez. We're looking at a view of about 30 kilometers long in here along the eastern shore of the Gulf of Suez. It's Anson Geology. We have some Precambrian basement lifted up and it's sedimentary cover. And the Precambrian basement forms two jebels or ridges seen here. And they are bounded on their left or western side by fault scarps. We can give these faults some names, the Derba Fault in the north and the Araba Fault in the south. Let's look at a cross section in the north. Here we go. Here's the Derba Fault down going towards the Gulf of Suez there. The Araba Fault further south. And they offset along a relay ramp. So faults come in different sizes and they're showing different displacements. Let's think how this might work. So it's what we're going to do now is plot some classical data for fault displacement and fault length to see if there's a relationship. Notice that this is a log-log plot. The data comes from all scales. So the small faults are the sorts of things you might see in drill core. We have outcrop as the next level up and then maybe seismic sections. And finally, the largest scale are the sorts of faults you might image on satellite data. So there's the plot. Let's populate it. This is a compilation, hundreds of faults measured for their displacement and their length. And you can plot them on the log log plot to create a quasi-linear relationship, such as you see there. So there's a simple relationship here, long faults have big displacements, short faults have small displacements. Now, of course, that's not entirely unexpected. Short faults can't have big displacements. So can we use this information to understand how faults grow? One idea might be that faults start off small and grow and acquire displacement as they do so. So here we have a situation with our fault about to grow grows a little bit and that's its length and a bit of displacement, grows a bit more, displaces some more, grows some more, displaces some more and eventually gets to this sort of relationship. So that's a linear relationship between fault growth where the length increases as the displacement increases. We can call this a propagating or self-similar model of fault growth and therefore the pattern that we have on the graph is a history where little faults grow up to become big faults. An alternative way of thinking about faults is the constant length model. In this case, faults grow rapidly to a long length, and then once they have achieved their size, they then accumulate displacement like this. We end up at the same point in our history where the fault has grown and has acquired displacement, but they've done so in a different way. We can put them together on the right-hand side and now finally look at another model for fault growth, which is the fault capture model, which says that we start off with little faults and they'll combine together to make a long fault. So here they go, they're growing self-similarly, growing towards each other, and then they capture one another, acquire some length, then accumulate some more displacement, and then keep going. So that's the fault capture model. The fault capture model would generate a jerky path up this graph. So these are different models for the faults. And perhaps maybe it's just a question of the life of a fault, that they'll show these different behaviours at different times as you grow a fault structure to become some major structure. So there we are, a quick introduction to fault displacement and growth. We've looked at displacements on single faults and seen that the displacements show bullseye patterns with a maximum in the middle decaying to zero at the edge. We've looked at three dimensions and the growth of faults and through and the formation of relay ramps. And we've used this information 
to try and understand something about the displacement length relationships and whether they can be interpreted in terms of fault evolution.